first, I have to ask you about the fluoride lawsuit because you've been, that has been the thing you've been covering for, how long has this been going, two weeks now? I was in San Francisco for two weeks, but the, the lawsuit's been about seven or eight years now. Right, yeah, we had uh, Michael Connett on and, and you know, I never knew all of the things about fluoride, all of the problems with fluoride until he educated myself and I'm sure a lot of people who watched that episode. So you've been covering the, and then he told us that they were going, you know, there was right, I think he came on the show the day before mm -hmm. they actually went into court and then they did the court. So the court hearing was two weeks long, roughly. Yeah, exactly. So day. yeah, exactly. Just wrapped up and I was there in San Francisco from, you know, day one till the very end. And I was live tweeting <laughs> five hours in the court and uh, writing some articles for The Last American Vagabond. I know you just had Ryan on. So yep. I've been following it closely. And then even before back in 2020, when the first phase of the trial began, it was only on Zoom Then I was live tweeting and following it then. So wow. it's an important story that I, I'm glad, you know, we're talking about it today because I think it's, it's, I'm sure Michael told you there's been no coverage of it in the mainstream at all. And that hasn't changed right. in the last two weeks. There hasn't been a single, uh, single peep from them. And uh, surprisingly, not a whole lot of main uh, alternative media talking about it as well. So happy to get the word out because there were yeah. some some pretty powerful revelations that came out in the last two weeks. I did have a chance to interview uh, the Fluoride Action Network, who Michael Conant is representing. I got a chance to interview three of their expert witnesses, Dr. Bruce uh, Lamphere, Dr. Philippe Granging, and Dr. Howard Hu. And I mean, some of the things they shared, these are the kind of things that you would expect in a different world. These would be on you know, the front page of the New York Times or something, uh, making it clear how dangerous fluoride is to pregnant mothers and how it is a neurotoxin. And so I'm happy to share some of that information today. Yeah, what did, uh, so the court case lasted two, so both sides got to present their cases. Um, what did the other side have to say for themselves? I mean, Michael came on and he gave a really good, uh, you know, gave, gave us a really good understanding of what the problems were with Florida. And I just thought, what, what in the world could the other side say? I mean, and why even just keep continuing to do this? Like, just stop putting it in the water. Yeah. Simply enough. What so the EPA, yeah, the EPA was basically the government attorneys that representing the EPA were basically their job the entire um, nine days of total court time seemed to be to try to paint as much doubt in the judge's mind. Um, judge Edward Chen, he, he's, he's a great judge in terms of have he seems to be fairly neutral, like he doesn't seem like he's on the government side. He's also not just giving it easy to Fluoride Action Network. He's um, really trying to keep up with it. And one other thing, just kind of side note here, the reason this trial is so unique is because it's the first time, at least in recent memory, where a federal judge is being asked to judge science. And, you know, scientists typically don't want their work second guessed by you know, lawyers or courts, things like that. So the judge, obviously not a scientist, is having to keep up and learn this information as it's happening in real time. And so he was asking a lot of questions and trying to understand, you know, what is a margin of exposure and point of departure and benchmark dose analysis and all this jargon that you really need to understand to get the science behind it. And so it, the EPA's job seemed to be to just confuse him and to make him have as much doubt and as much uncertainty as possible, because essentially what Michael Conant and his side are having to argue and are trying to prove is that under the Toxic Substance Control Act, TSCA, that fluoride is a neurotoxin and thus it should be banned. But if the EPA can succeed at confusing the judge or or making him doubt the evidence, then, you know, they're trying to say, look, it's just not strong enough. Uh, you shouldn't make a ruling because, yeah, we now recognize that levels of two milligrams per liter in fluoridated water, there is some sort of harm. We can't quite distinguish when it begins. They would rather it be murky and cloudy than anything definitive, right? And so they're trying to tell the judge, yes, we recognize there's problems at higher levels, but down here at 0.7 milligrams per liter, which is what the CDC recommends, it's less certain and less clear. And so you really can't make a conclusion. I just don't even know why they're fighting this. Are they being sued for a lot of money and that's why they feel like they need to fight it? Or is this just a cease and desist putting fluoride in our water? This is just, a, there's no money involved at the moment. This is just the, the lawsuit was a result of the EPA rejecting the petition, which citizens can file petitions under TSCA. And so this is also historic because it's the first time a petition made it all the way to a federal court. But in terms of money and kind of financial interest, one of the reasons I think that there's such a pushback here is you have to consider that we're, you know, we're coming up on 80 years now of water fluoridation in the United States. As the trial was going on, the UK announced that they're, you know, interested in developing a program potentially fluoridating that country. Canada is studying it right now. So it's still a policy that is being promoted 
For example, the CDC has it on their top 10 uh, public health achievements of the 20th century, along with vaccines. It's still very much held in this high regard. And so you'd have to imagine the CDC, the FDA, the ADA, the American Dental Association, and any other branch of government or organization who has spent the last 80 years promoting this could potentially be open to class action lawsuits as parents start to ask, did my child lose a few IQ points? Is my thyroid messed up because of my exposure to uh, water fluoridation? Is my liver and kidney, are they suffering? Because there's so many other um, issues associated with fluoride. The trial specifically focused on the neurotoxic uh, elements, which is obviously important, especially we're talking about prenatal and postnatal. So why the baby, while the babies are just forming, it, it's, it's crucial. But there's so many other impacts of fluoride that really there, it doesn't make any sense. But that's essentially what they're trying to do is to try to downplay the evidence because I believe they are worried that there could be class action lawsuits if the judge finds in favor of the Fluoride Action Network. Well, there would be if it turns out that they knew this information and they just ignored it. I mean, it's one thing if they really didn't know and the science has just come out, right? But it's one. Th it's another thing if they are fully aware of this and they just said, yeah, it's all right. We're still doing it because cavities. I mean, that, that's the other well, thing that's just so ridiculous about it. It's and to that cavities. point, to that point, it, during the last two weeks, it has come out. I mean, it, there's definitely the evidence is available. We know, for example, Dr. Philippe Grangin from uh, Denmark uh, respected scientist. It's his work on mercury that actually the EPA used to develop the mercury uh, toxicity standards. You also had Dr. Mm -hmm. Bruce Lanfear done work on lead. These these guys are testifying in court about the information that they've known. And Dr. Philippe Grangin actually told the story of another Danish researcher named Kai Roham, who was a scientist back in the 1930s, who went to Greenland to study the uh, cryolite mine workers there. They were mining this cryolite mineral and a part of that they were uh, exposed to fluoride. And so he started studying it back then in the 1930s. He published a book in 1937. He was the first person to discover skeletal fluorosis and just discussing all the different problems, health problems that these men were dealing with. So here we are nearly a hundred years later and st still trying to convince people that this isn't some conspiracy theory, that you're not a wacko. Because as, as I'm sure you know, Kim talking about this in mainstream society would not get you the respect you would like as a journalist. And for me, as somebody who's following this and keeps up with it, it's kind of mind blowing that I'm in the federal courtroom following this. And most people have no idea it's even happening. If I was to walk outside the courtroom and ask people what they thought about fluoride, they'd probably call my, me a conspiracy theorist for questioning it, right? So there, there really is this evidence that we have now through this lawsuit and through more of the data that has come out that not only is, has the science been there and the data has been there, but uh, if I could just for a second, I'd like to point out something that Dr. F uh, Granjean told me because he worked at the WHO and he worked at Harvard and he told me some pretty powerful statements just this last week about how essentially he was ran out of Harvard because they didn't like that his data was starting to show that fluoride is a neurotoxin. Um, he also said he was invited to participate. I'll just read from him. I don't want to misquote him, but if I can, again, this is Dr. Philippe Branch, and he says, uh, this is about Harvard first. He says, a professor from Harvard University came to my office and asked me to sign a statement that my work on fluoride had nothing to do with fluoridation. He actually wrote this draft, and since I didn't sign this immediately, he instead went to my dean, and he had the dean sign a statement that he supported water fluoridation in accordance with the policy of CDC. And he said after that, that leadership at Harvard told him that his research was unwanted, and he said, quote, because we couldn't agree on what I would consider my academic freedom, I left Harvard. And then in terms of the World Health Organization, he was invited to speak or to participate in helping them develop um, what they call an environmental, I think it was an environmental assessment of fluoride and help them develop environmental health criteria. And he said, as he started to gather the data and put it together, he noticed that changes were being made to his draft report. He said, quote, they inserted changes in my draft indicating that fluoride could perhaps be toxic, but only at immense concentrations. I protested and said that in accordance with the scientific documentation, it would be wrong to insert the word immense. And so the WHO published a document without my name because I'd asked to have my name stricken. And then they inserted some other colleague's name as the author of the draft, which is, of course, erroneous. But that was what the WHO felt was necessary in order to protect the interests of water fluoridation. Yeah, and it's just, wow. And it's so bizarre because when I was talking to Michael Conant about it, I mean, what, what is their, why do they want to keep doing that just for cavities? I mean, this is not like, hey, we're saving lives by vaccinating you against COVID for saving grandma, although that would be the next step. And that's what worries me. It almost makes me feel like that's why they're fighting this. They're fighting this because they want the ability. It's not about fluoridation of the water itself. It's about the ability to medicate us in mass in this oh, way. Oh, absolutely. As they yeah. feel like it. 
That is definitely, I think, a crucial uh, argument to pick apart because over the years, I've been involved with fighting fluoride back in Houston. I started an activist group called Fluoride for Houston. We were going to visit council members and talking to people. And I realized that the scientific data, especially if you're not a scientist, most people are, are most skeptical of. They're like, I don't know, man. How do you know this? The dentist says it's okay. All these scientists say it's okay. But then you could talk to people about uh, the argument you're making that it's the only thing added to the water that is for medication. And right. shouldn't you have the right to medicate yourself how you choose? Shouldn't you have the right to use fluoride toothpaste if you want, or to add it to your water if you like? Why don't right. you know? And in and, and the case of water fluoridation, of course, your tax dollars, especially in the United States, are literally going to pay to add this toxic substance to the water instead of the mining companies where, where a lot of this comes from, aluminum phosphate mining, instead of them having to dispose of it on their own, they're getting your city or your town to pay to add it to the water. So, it, you know, you could argue about the, it's a financial waste. It's a, it's a health harm. It is a, a violation of your bodily autonomy. I think any argument you use is fine and it fails on all of them. It really does. I mean, it really, really does. What, how do you, so was there a jury or was it just the judge who, who decides in the end? This is a bench trial, so it's just the judge. So as you know, we wrap today. Now the judge will sit with the evidence, and uh, you know we're expecting weeks, probably could be months. We're not really sure. I do know the judge based on his previous statements. He seems to be getting the gravity of the situation now. That essentially every moment that the fluoride is still in the water, and people aren't told that it's a neurotoxin. Pregnant mothers are consuming it, and instead of getting a warning about, hey, you should avoid this while you're pregnant and really all together, but you know, just to kind of put a cap on that, the data that was presented during the last week or two, the, uh, Dr. Howard Hu was talking about how uh, as a mother progresses along her pregnancy, by the third trimester, she's getting just high, high amounts of fluoride as it increases throughout her pregnancy. And why is that? Well, mothers tend to drink more water, consume more as they're progressing, their baby's growing. So they need to get more nutrients in there. And of course the baby, everything that the baby has just come from the mother. So in that third trimester, as the baby starts to form its own skeletal structure, it's going to be pulling typically calcium from the mother's bones, but fluoride stores in your bones and it displaces uh, the iodine and your thyroid, it, it stores in your body. And so as the baby's pulling, it's what it needs, the nutrients and everything else to make its own body and calcium from the, the bones of its mother, it's going to receive that fluoride directly into the placenta through the blood brain barrier. And so, I mean, I've been focused on this for years, but honestly, the last two weeks being in the courtroom and hearing this data, it just has kind of reinvigorated in me how important it is to get this information to as many potential mothers or current mothers, because, you know, you're drinking it in the fluoride water. That's one thing. But if you're eating processed food, it's more than likely fluoridated. If you go out to eat more, unless it's specifically reverse osmosis, it's probably fluoridated. The shower, it's a pest, it's in pesticides as well. Um, it, there's a lot of different exposures. So the water is just one source of it. And you really need to kind of grapple with that and recognize that if you are pregnant or considering having a baby, the data is showing that it will negatively impact your child's cognitive development if they are being exposed to this while you're pregnant. I guess uh, the people that want to continue doing this just want to raise a nation of uh, dummies, right? <laughs> they want us dumber. It sure seems that way, right? <laughs> so we don't push back. We don't challenge them. We just follow along. Okay, okay. Whatever you want. Wow, that is just so. So, the, why a bench trial? Why why not a jury? It just seems like a lot of power for one person to hold in their hands, whether or not to ban fluoride from being put in our water. I'm not sure if that was a decision made by Michael Conant and the Fluoride Action Network, or if that's just how it works in the terms of the EPA's uh, TASCA petitions, because this is a sort of, again, it's like an unprecedented situation. I think there was even some confusion on how does this move forward? What's the next step? You know, how do you proceed with this? And we ended up with Judge Edward Chen, who, as I mentioned earlier, I do think in terms of court systems, and obviously they're not perfect and they can be corrupted, and I'm fully on board with that. Um, but if for the current system we have, if you're going to have judges, you would want somebody that seems to be very neutral and not easily swayed. And, and that's what I've witnessed right. over the last few years is he does seem to be genuinely trying to get to the bottom. And I would honestly say, you know, I've had a lot of people ask my assessment. I would say it, it definitely looks good. It's hard these days to kind of have any optimism because of just how bad things can be. So I'm skeptically optimistic, but um, I, I do think the judge was listening and there were definitely multiple times. If I could share just one more brief moment actually yeah. to kind of 
emphasize this. One of the government's witnesses is Dr. Stanley Barone, who is a senior science policy advisor with the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention at the EPA. He was involved in doing risk assessments for the EPA, specifically under TSCA. So definitely would be considered an expert, so much to the point that he was actually a witness for the plaintiffs, the Floyd Action Network, and for the government. But there was this really key moment on the last day of actual testimony from the witnesses where Michael Conant, who is, I think, a brilliant attorney, was just doing a great job drilling into Dr. Barone because, again, the government's witness's job is to be as difficult as possible, not really answer directly yes, but caveats and, okay, I'll offer a long-winded answer and maybe the judge is confused by the end. And uh, he was doing that, but Michael Conant was really just keying in on talking about pregnant mothers and the kidneys and oversaturation and how the those who have difficulty already processing things through their kidney – fluoride is going to build up in them. It's going to affect them even more. And a lot of the arguments have been, look, even if we know we can, you know, we can't pinpoint the exact place that fluoride causes harm using what's called the uncertainty factor. We should be considering the most vulnerable populations, which is what the EPA has done every time before. And it should probably just be banned regardless. That's how they've acted right. with mercury and with, uh, with lead. But yeah. so Michael Conant is asking Dr. Barone about this. And he says, uh, it specifically, he says, you testified earlier today that there may be oversaturation going on in the kidney at the 95th percentile level in the fluoridated areas. Do you feel comfortable as a risk assessor exposing pregnant women to a level of fluoride that is so high that the kidney is oversaturated? And at this point, Dr. Barone just froze on the stand. I mean, everybody in the courtroom kind of noticed everything got super quiet. And I think at least five to seven seconds passed before he even said anything, which was a pretty strong moment. The judge noticed it. The judge was sitting there watching the whole thing. The EPA tried to at one point kind of intervene in the line of questioning, but the judge, you know, overruled them and allowed it to go on. And in the end, Dr. Brown basically offered this winding, no, but this and that. And at the end, he said, uh, my opinion isn't germane to the discussion. So he's there on the stand as an EPA risk assessor expert. And when asked this question. He has no answer. And then he says, my opinion doesn't matter. It was yeah. a really powerful moment. And unfortunately, none of the, as, as far as we know, the court record, the court video might not make it to the public, but if it does, I will be sure to clip that moment out and share it yeah. around. It really seems like in the minimum, the judge would say, you have to start putting warning labels on water, I guess. <laughs> like people need to be told, you know, at the minimum, if they're not going to ban it, at least, at least let people know, especially you know, as Michael mentioned when he was on the show, people, pregnancy, infants, it definitely, um, they, they're targeted, but also um, the kidney, the people with kidney problems. And the, the thing is, is that those who are having suffering from kidney failure, you need to drink extra water. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they need even more water than the average person. They have to stay really hydrated. Um, from what I remember, I think that's yep. right. And they will consume more fluoride as of, as of you know, if, unless they're, Which they're not drinking fluoridated process. water. Exactly. Right, so and that, that's pretty much what this question was about is like, do you not care about the people who are already suffering and the fact that this is going to build up in their bodies and their kidneys will become oversaturated with it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like you should have a choice. If you want to drink fluoridated water, maybe, I don't know, maybe Brita could come out with a special filter <laughs> where it's added. <laughs> and then you can add that into the water if you want to have that extra benefit of no cavities or, or fewer cavities or whatever. Right. I mean, it's it's just such a. I agree. You know, and, and one. one one other argument about that, Kim, I'll just add, because I think this is, again, another topic that gets labeled as right-wing conspiracy theory, but I've spent a lot of my time in my activism working with activists from across the spectrum, and I've spent some effort trying to get uh, folks who are more left-leaning progressive to see that this is an issue that should matter. And I just want to throw that out there, that what you were just saying, look, if you're somebody who cares about the poor, cares about lower economic, socioeconomic status, that is who's going to be impacted by this the most, because who can... Who can afford to buy filters for their showers and for their houses? Usually people who've got a little bit of extra money to spare, right? Or who've got the time or the money to buy five five-gallon BPA-free jugs and go to the local filter station and fill it up. Maybe you don't have a car and that's not convenient. Maybe you don't have the time, the money, et cetera. So if the people who are going to be impacted by this the most will always be the poor folks. So yeah. if you consider yourself an activist who cares about those things, that's something to think about. And the other thing is I've, I think that uh, fluoride, the fight against water fluoridation could be framed for those who need this kind of framing or who enjoy it uh, as a, um, a, a, an example of environmental racism, if you will, because again, it's going to impact those in the lower economic status who tend to be poor people. Not obviously some people are white and poor, but, typically black and brown neighborhoods. So if that's right. the way, that's the argument you want to take, the argument is there, you know, so whether you're left, right, whatever, I think there's so many arguments to uh, 
trying to convince people on the local level and then hopefully here on the federal level to get it out of the water as soon as possible. Yeah. And just if you want, you know, brush your teeth with fluoride toothpaste, mouthwash with fluoride mouthwash. I can't, you know, it's like such a basic, uh, if you want that benefit, you can have that benefit in many other ways. We don't need to force everybody to drink it. Uh, my biggest concern in hearing about this lawsuit is the, just the lack of medical autonomy. It really just having the, the ability for them to force a medication on us for the only reason, and the only reason it's there is for medication. It's not purifying the water. It's not doing anything like that. Uh, that to me is just really, really, really frightening. Hey guys, be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you like this segment. Now you might be wondering, this seems like it's part of a bigger show. You're right, it is. The full show is at kimiversonshow.com. So what you're watching is just a clip. And if you wanna get the full experience, then you gotta go to kimiversonshow.com. The show airs Monday through Friday, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern at kimiversonshow.com. That is where you can watch the full show. Here, you just get clips. So click on the link down below. Go to the full show. Enjoy. Otherwise, I'll see you next time right here. And be sure, once again, like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.